All right, as so we begin the next little discussion here, um, think about your lab results from last week. And two kind of questions to get you going and what we're, where we're going today. Why did the aluminum expand so much more than the brass? Both metals, but noticeable differences in thermal expansion. Uh, as you went to the hardness test, you saw that the metals were much harder than the plastics. If you tested ceramics, they were even harder still. And so the next thing we want to cover really helps us to answer those kinds of questions. And what we're going to talk about here is bonding. And when we define the energy of a bond between two um, atoms as the energy necessary to separate them to an infinite distance where they don't interact anymore, where the two charges associated, um, or whatever it is that's attracting them, um, doesn't, uh, doesn't act anymore. So if you plot force versus the distance, um, if they get too close, there's a repulsive force between the two atoms or whatever's bonding. And, but then as they separate, you have an attractive force that's pulling them back together. But as you reach a critical distance, that uh, you overcome that attractive force, and then the force begins to weaken with greater and greater distance. The work necessary to break the bonds is the area under this curve. It's the integral of the force times the, the distance, um, uh, differential of distance. Or if you just had physics one, you know, work is force times distance, but the force isn't a simple, it's a varying value. So we have to add up all of the individual elements of the... So again, the uh, total work to separate the atoms is the energy of the bond. Now, we're going to see that there's some ways we can kind of measure that. Now, there are three primary bond types. Um, the first of these is the ionic primary bond. And basically what we have here are atoms that are on opposite sides of the periodic table, or uh, you may think more generally, a metal and a non-metal. Um, in general, we have to have significant differences in the electronegativity. Um, that is, one atom wants to take electrons, the other is not going to hang on to them very strongly. And so we get a donated electron. And um, one atom loses an electron, becomes a positive ion. Um, the other atom has taken that electron to become a negative ion, and so opposites attract, just as in life, and you have an ionic bond. Now, ionic bonds have a couple of important characteristics. Here's a classic ionic solid. This is sodium chloride, and so you have chlorine ions. The anions are negative ions. They've taken the electron, um, are the green, and the red are sodium cations, or positive. And you may remember cats have paws, and that's how you know so cations positive. Anyway, the point of this kind of a structure, or the, the interesting property that an engineer should be aware of is, this is quite stable. Um, however, these anions have to have cations neighboring. They cannot be or do not, are not stable if an anion is a neighbor, if the negative charge is next door. So if I get a piece of this material, there is no way to change the shape of this material without basically fracturing it into two pieces. These atoms cannot rearrange. They're pretty much locked into these arrangements. Um, and so, as we're going to see with some other bonding types, it's possible to take and slide planes of atoms past each other, and that just doesn't happen with ionic solids because they need these very particular neighbors. Now, what are some ionic materials? Um, there are a lot that are quite important. Alumina is aluminum oxide. is tremendously important to us. You're using it in lab furnace linings. Um, it's used in hard parts for abrasives. Alumina is one of the hardest materials we have, and so it's used in abrasive. When you polish your bolts this week in lab, you'll be using aluminum oxide or alumina, which is an ionic solid as your abrasive. Uh, the crucibles that we use for burning out um, composites and other things um, are ionic materials. Silica, which is um, the basic constituent of sand, quartz, glass, uh, porcelain, uh, is also an ionic material. All right, the next kind of bonding is covalent primary bonds. And here the key is the two elements have quite similar electronegativities. In general, we're talking two nonmetals um, are going to form covalent bonds, and they're going to share electrons. And so this is called covalent because they are shared valence electrons. And the idea is um, 
the red atom shares an electron that will spend some time around the blue, and the blue atom's electron will spend some time around the red. So they'll have a, an orbital that now encompasses both nuclei, and it holds them together. Um, why are we doing that? In terms of large-scale covalent structures, you're familiar with diamond, a girl's best friend, and uh, graphite, which is increasingly important. Uh, graphene is graphite, where we've separated out these individual layers. But these are carbon allotropes. And so in diamond, each carbon atom is covalently bonded to four other carbon atoms in this three-dimensional structure. And the covalent bonds are inherently quite strong. And so diamond's tremendously hard material because it's entirely covalently bonded. Graphite has tremendous properties in certain directions because of the covalent bonding of the carbons. But between these layers, we have a much weaker type of bonding we'll talk about. And there really aren't shared electrons between the layers. So graphite is used as a lubricant because you can break it up and these tear off into these nice little flat plates that are incredibly smooth. And they'll fill in rough surfaces and then you have a very smooth surface for uh, sliding. And so you've seen graphite as a lubricant or a dry lubricant for those reasons. But within the plane, this is tremendously strong material, and graphene has uh, exciting engineering properties because of that. Now, the reality is most primary bonding of the ionic covalent character is actually mixed. It is not completely ionic or completely covalent. And the reason for that is the electron activities, unless they are exactly the same, a covalent bond will not involve perfectly even sharing of the electrons. So a 2.5 bonded to a 2.4, the 2.5 electronegativity element is going to hang on to the electron a little bit more than the 2.4 does, and you're going to get a little bit of polarization, a little bit of negative charge development on the high eneg element. You're going to have some ionic character then. So we see perfect covalent bonding only with elements with exactly the same electronegativities which means elements bonded to themselves always, as well as certain pairs of elements can form perfect covalent bonds. In class, we'll be talking about calculating the percent ionic character. Um, and so if we do those calculations, here's some example materials. And so magnesium oxide is a primarily ionic material. It has a melting temperature. It's quite high, 2,798 degrees. As we go down to 50-50 mixed covalent ionic character, silicon dioxide, we see the, elect the uh, melting temperatures dropped. As we then move into more and more pure covalent bonding, the melting temperature goes back up again. So in general, the uh, highly covalent or highly ionic bonds are quite strong, and in the mixture, um, you see some suppression of the melting temperature. Melting point is a good uh, measure of bond strength, as we talked about last week, Temperature is simply a measure of the kinetic energy of the atoms or molecules that you're talking about. And so when you hit the melting temperature, the atoms have the kinetic energy necessary to break the bonds. And so it's a direct measurement, really, of bond energy uh, intrinsic to the material. So nice, and nice uh, proxy for that. All right, the last type of primary bond uh, is metallic bonding. And the key here is... The nuclei, the atoms, all need a lot of electrons to get any kind of complete shell, outer shell. And so there's just no way they're going to load up on that many electrons. So what they do is they all share their valence electrons in a large cloud. And so the nuclei will be arranged. These are random. They're usually going to have some structure. And then the electrons will just float around these nuclei. Very nonspecific bonding. The nuclei don't care who the neighbors are. They'll, they'll change neighboring atoms easily. Um, as long as the electron cloud is maintained, you can rearrange, rearrange the ion cores quite easily. The other thing that this does for us is this free electron cloud makes metals look like metals. That's why they have a sheen. It's also those free electrons which make them such fantastic conductors. So you get... Um, both electrical conduction, because a small potential applied to the material will cause the electrons to respond and flow, um, but also good thermal conductivity, because if heat is really a measure of kinetic energy, electrons have kinetic energy. And if I heat electrons up on this side, because they move freely, they can carry that kinetic energy throughout the material. So in general, electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity go together where electrons are the primary uh, transmitters of that kinetic energy.
And so we see those properties. Now, that leads to, you know, if you pay attention when you go to the movie, there's a lot of silliness in movies. And a classic piece of silliness from uh, the 1990s is uh, Star Trek II or Star Trek IV, where Mr. Scott sells the secret of transparent aluminum to get the goods they need to bring whales back to the future or whatever. The point here, and my problem with this, and it should be yours if you become a good engineer and are appropriately critical, um, is that you can't make aluminum transparent and have it still be aluminum. Uh, the thing that holds aluminum together is the metallic bond. It is not transparent because of the metallic bond. And in order to turn off the metallic bond to make it transparent, you would have to make it cease to be solid. Um, if you want to make an aluminum oxide transparent, go ahead. That's not a problem. And so you can take compounds of aluminum and make them transparent. But those are ionically or covalently bonded, primarily ionically bonded materials. But a metallically bonded material cannot be clear. Now, go Google this, and you'll find some guys who have made transparent aluminum, but they've simply made a very fancy and expensive screen door by punching holes in the aluminum. So anyway, homework for you there. All right, what do I expect you to be able to do with this knowledge? Um, you're going to have the equation character. So if I ask for that in particular, you should be able to do that using the equation book and, and references. But you should be able to look at a compound pair and identify the predominant bonding type without reference to any of those things. So lithium, bromide, lithium is over here. Bromine is way over here. This is one of the halogens. And so electronegativity 2.8, electronegativity 1.0, that's a very large difference. This is going to be a primarily ionic material. Understand there is always some covalent nature, but we would consider this a primarily ionic compound. Similarly, you go through copper sulfate, find copper. It's a metal here, element 29. I'm sorry, this is just copper and sulfur, not a sulfate, no oxygen. And sulfur's here, so what's going to happen? Metal, non-metal. Now, you notice the electronegativity difference here is not very great. So this will be a much lower percent ionic character, um, but it is a metal and non-metal, so our expectation is for significant ionic uh, contribution. And at this point, pause the video, and you may want to go through and be sure you know how to do um, all of these as well. All right. A couple other applications of this bond, um, the bond structure and, and the kind of information that that gives us. Um, the, the first thing is that we're going to be worried a great deal about the strength of bonds and materials. Now, it turns out strength of the bond isn't everything. Um, it's complicated. But the strength of the bond is going to be a good indicator of um, the modulus or what we consider the stiffness of the material, that is how much it uh, deforms if you put a, a force on it. Um, it's also an indicator of the temperature of melting. Obviously, this is a direct measurement of kinetic energy of the particles necessary to break the bond. So high bond strengths can be reflected in high melting temperature. And this is also very important for determining coefficient of thermal expansion. If the bond um, is strong, and that means it's got a very deep well, and that means the bond is going to be quite stiff. And so as you heat up the atoms, they're not going to be able to stretch the bond as much. So high bond strength materials will tend to have a low thermal expansion because this, you can think of the spring that is the bond is very stiff. It doesn't allow the atoms to uh, separate. Also, the electronic bond structure um, is really critical for our thermal and electrical conductivity. And we talked about the energy levels of the different, or the different energy levels, and the fact that there's a gaps between the allowable energy states. If you think back to the, um, to the graph of the energy levels of all of the valence electrons, and so depending on the element, you have um, energy levels that are uh, filled or partially filled and maybe some unfilled bands, okay? Why? Because metals are way short of the electrons they need to fill, um, particularly energy levels. And so it's easy for electrons to be excited from this band up just a little bit to a higher empty state, or for electrons to move into this empty state temporarily and be conducted. And so metals have only partially filled energy levels and are very good conductors because electrons don't really have to change energy level to move from one electron, uh, one element to another. 
Um, you also can have overlapping empty bands. The key here is it's possible for electrons to jump um, into uh, an empty energy level in a neighboring atom without an increase in their own energy level. That energy level is at the same level they are, um, but is an empty spot. With insulators, the problem is um, you have a valence band, but it's completely filled, and in order to get to an allowable energy level for the electron, remember they can only stay in certain kinds of apartments, um, you need a big increase in rent. You have a big energy barrier. And so these are insulators because electrons need tremendous energy jumps in order to move up and be conducted. Now, insulators have, a, have what's called a breakdown voltage. You can't apply a high enough voltage to give these electrons this energy to jump this gap, but it is usually quite high. And um, when we design insulators, that's one of the things we have to consider is that they have a big enough band gap that if the maximum voltage the system will see will not cause electrons to be able to jump um, and conduct. Semiconductors, the key is this band gap is very small. And so if I apply the right voltage, we can get electrons to jump. So, you know, if you go back, let's, we'll just go back really quickly here, to this slide that started it all as we began the discussions of the energy levels. And so the, the thing about these metals is, um, let's say we're, let's pick a tungsten here. Okay, there's a a whole bunch of empty spaces around, empty uh, orbital spots around a tungsten atom, and they're all at the same energy level. So if an electron from a neighboring tungsten atom wants to join this guy, there's, there's empty spaces at exactly the same energy. For non-conductors, your problem is, um, let's see, these are all metals. I don't have a non-metal here. Uh, elements are... Um, the problem for nonmetals or for insulators is that maybe this is your filled shell and you need to jump. The next available energy level is here, and this is a big gap in energy. And so um, it's not going to be easy for electrons to do that. Okay, so that's the conductivity, strength, melting temperature, and that leads us then finally to secondary bonding. And secondary bonding is going to be of great importance in thermodynamics and fluids because you're dealing with fluids and gases there. Uh, and those are, uh, a liquid is held together by secondary bonds. That's the difference between a liquid and a gas. But they are going to be significant to us even in solids because they play a very large role in polymers. So I want to quickly cover these. Uh, you may need to go back and review this uh, when we get to polymers uh, again. There are three kinds of secondary bonds of increasing strength. The uh, weakest of the bonds is called a fluctuating induced dipole bond. And Basically, we have two neutral molecules. Nitrogen bonded to nitrogen is a pure covalent bond. And so this is an entirely neutral molecule, no polarization naturally, this you know, no ionic character. But these electrons, remember, are hyperactive preschoolers on the playground. And if it's warm, then they have a lot of energy and they have had Kool-Aid for snack time. And so they're bouncing around here. And so at any instant, they're not all evenly distributed around the playground. You're going to have more electrons, perhaps, right here around this, uh, hanging around this nitrogen for just an instant. And that produces a momentary polarization. Well, these electrons on the other side of the fence, they're, they're also at recess. And so when you have this little polarization, um, this is uh, going to repel some of these electrons. They're not going to want to spend as much time on this end of the molecule. That shifts their probability distribution and uh, maybe somebody threw up by the fence and so now they're all over here on the other side of the playground, whatever. But that creates a positive charge, negative charge, and you get a momentary bond. And then the fluctuations, this all goes away and we lose this bond. So they're very weak, very short-lived. And so nitrogen does not make a liquid very easily. It has to be very cold to remain in liquid form. Otherwise, these molecules have too much kinetic energy and they uh, break this bond. Now, the bond can be made a little stronger if one of the molecules is polar. So water, H2O here, has permanent polarization. The hydrogen atom is permanently positive. The oxygen is negative. And so I can take a neutral molecule like O2, which is important. Without this property, um, fish would not be able to breathe underwater. Um, and that induces some polarization. It tracks electrons. This positive does. If it was near the oxygen, it would repel the electrons. The key is we get... Oh, it's doing this. 
we get uh, a uh, polarization develops here. We get a brief attraction. But it's stronger because this is a permanent pole. And so water has a fairly decent solubility for oxygen. And this is going to show up in polymers um, significantly. And then finally, the strongest of the Van der Waals bonds is um, a permanent dipole bond. And there's even a super version of this. And the key here is both of the molecules are polar. So I have a permanent negative charge, permanent positive charge. We get a fairly strong bond here. CO2 will do the same thing. And this really points up the importance of bonding. The molecular mass of CO2 is 44, um, 16, 16, and 12. The molecular mass of H2O is only 18. So carbon dioxide is twice as heavy. Each molecule weighs twice as much as a water molecule, more than twice as much. And yet, water is a liquid at room temperature, and CO2 is definitely a gas, and in fact does not become a solid till very, very low temperatures. Why? It's not, it doesn't have much to do with the mass. It has everything to do with the attraction. Similarly, many hydrocarbons like gasoline have very large molecules and very high molecular weights. Their numbers may be up over 100 AMUs, and yet they vaporize easily at room temperature because they have no um, significant polarity, and so the van der Waals bonds are very weak. Now, there's a very special version of secondary bonding we call hydrogen bonding. And the key thing, and this is a confusion to many students, is that in hydrogen bonding, we're not talking about how the hydrogen bonds to oxygen. This is a covalent bond, polar covalent bond. We're talking about what's bonding the molecules together that contain the hydrogen. Now, when hydrogen bonds to oxygen, fluorine, and nitrogen, you get very strong polarization. There's a big electronegativity difference. If you remember, this is four. Oxygen is three and a half. Nitrogen is three. Hydrogen's about two, and so the electronegativity difference is very large. The key is oxygen, fluorine, and nitrogen are very small as well. So this is a highly concentrated positive charge and a highly concentrated negative charge that produces very strong secondary bonds that we call hydrogen bonding. Any other hydrogen bonded anything else, you may have significant polarity, but you're not going to get this powerful secondary bond that we get with oxygen, fluorine, and nitrogen. Now. From that, you should be able to look at this list and order these from highest to lowest boiling point. As which of these has the strongest secondary bonds and which has the weakest, and then the other two go in the middle. So why don't you pause the video at this moment and take a few minutes and see if you can order these. Now, let's see how well you did. Carbon dioxide doesn't even boil, it doesn't even turn to liquid, it sublimes at minus 78 and to minus 196, H2O 100, methane 161. The logic here should be what kind of bond are we going to get? And so you look at H2O, this is polar, weakly polar, no polar, weakly polar. Okay? So this is the most polar molecule. Oh, and it's that hydrogen bonding thing. So this is going to be number one. This is perfectly covalent no polarity, so it's going to be the weakest type of bond, and so obviously this is your loser. It's going to have the lowest boiling point. And then these two, you know, it's a little trickier. You need to kind of reason out, well, this electronegativity difference, negativity difference, I'm sorry, is bigger than this electronegativity difference. You should have gone back to the uh, table of electronegativities, 2.2, 2.4, this is 3.5, and 2.4. And so this is more polar, which means it's going to have a little bit higher boiling point. And it doesn't boil, but it does sublime at minus 78. OK. Now, why do we care? Well, immediately, we're not doing a lot with liquids, but we're going to care a great deal when we get to polymers. And let's talk about this just as a one little application. We, the simplest way to build a polymer is to take a carbon backbone, and um, most polymers are hydrocarbons, that is, they have a carbon backbone with hydrogens attached. Carbon likes to form four covalent bonds, so we get this wonderful two carbon neighbors, two hydrogens. He's got four neighbors. Everybody's happy. And it's all covalent bonding, which means it's quite strong, so you get great properties. But between these chains, we have very weak van der Waals bonds because this is not a polar bond. And because it's not polar, we don't get much, much attraction. So the bonding between polyethylene chains is quite weak. But we can come in and we can substitute 
on every other carbon, we're going to take a hydrogen away and put a chlorine on there. And you get polyvinyl chloride. And so you notice every other carbon has a chlorine on it. And those chlorines t fundamentally alter the nature. They don't change the backbone properties. It's still carbon, carbon, carbon all the way. But now I have these spots of negative polarization because the, low carbon, the chlorine has a high electron activity. So now I have permanent polarity, and that means we're going to get stronger van der Waals bonds between the chains. Now, the measure of that van der Waals bond strength, the primary measure, is what we call the glass transition temperature. Above this temperature, this material behaves as a rubbery, flexible material. Below this temperature, it's rigid like glass. It's going to be very, very hard and brittle. In fact, polyethylene will shatter below 120 like glass does. PVC has a TG of 82 polycarbonate. The TG is minus 120 degrees. Weak van der Waals bonds, low TG. Strong van der Waals bonds, TG above room temperature, and PVC makes pretty good water piping because it's rigid enough and can handle the high temperatures of the water from your water heater. And so that concludes the basics of bonding. Um, next up will be large-scale structures, crystals.